John asked the question of um, what macular pigment would be good for on the savanna in, in, in primates. And, and uh, there are optical properties, too, which I haven't talked about much. And I'm not going to talk much about them. But you, you, you can show by calculation that, that, that the more macular pigment you have as you look out over the savanna, uh, the, the better the contrast in the, in the retinal image itself. So, uh, and I think Randy Hammond is going to talk something about that. So that will uh, 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 be something to look forward to. Also, I've just observed uh, uh, an effect right here where uh, the amount of macular pigment will depend will, will determine in part how much you see uh, 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 this effect. Notice those blue lights up there. And if we, if I hold my hand right here, you see uh, you see the colored shadows there. And, and, and it, it, de it depends on the contrast between the blue reflected light and the uh, uh, yellow reflected light from the lamps. And of course, the, the amount of macular pigment you have. Everybody see the yellow and, and the blue and so on? That's just a, a minor effect. If you had no macular pigment at all, you'd see a lot bigger effect here. If you had a huge amount, you might not see any. So uh, they just have visual effects. And curious uh, question, of course, is what, what drives all this? They just could be appendages to the evolutionary force from uh, antioxidant or protection from the blue or whatever. Nevertheless, they, they provide interesting uh, uh, and amusing uh, demonstrations. Uh, in, 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 anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see. And um, I, I want to start uh, with just a, a, a terminological issue. The, the, the title of the talk is uh, Measurement of Macular Pigment in Vivo, and we don't have to emphasize the uh, interest here and the importance both in the laboratory and in the clinic, and I've been involved in helping people do that. But, but before, I, I, by the way, I can't carry out that charge because if you think about it, there's a tremendous amount of different methods and so on, but we'll get back to that. Before that, though, uh, John said, uh, uh, Billy, do what you want. And, and, and so one thing I, I, I wanted to do uh, uh, is uh, uh, get a little pet peeve off my chest or, or, or where, wherever it is. And uh, it, it's, it's no big deal, it's a terminological distinction, but sometimes that can cause uh, uh, confusion. If you ever taught color vision, for example, and you refer to red, green, and blue cones, uh, it's an absolute mess because, uh, 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 you know, red cones aren't red and, and so on and so on. Uh, so terminology is important. This is a minor issue, so you'll forgive me, it won't take long. But sometimes the classification uh, that people use between uh, uh, certain methods uh, imply certain attributes of these methods that may or may, not, may or may not be true. And it's common to use objective versus subjective with respect to these methods. So objective is when you, you have some kind of signal generated from light, uh, any elastic collisions uh, produce Raman effect, for example, uh, uh, you, uh, autofluorescence, reflection. Uh, uh, those all require an observer, but, but a dead observer would give the same thing, if not dead too long, I suppose up the optics of the eye would quickly cloud and you get really lousy data. But, but objective in this sense it, you know, implies that NPOD measurement is, is not affected should be by psychological attributes of the observer uh, other than purely uh, uh, physical facts like color uh, of the uh, iris or, or lens density or, or something like that. And the question that seems to be true, uh, let's just think about it for a second. Subjective implies that MPOD measurement is affected by psychological attributes of the observer. You can make them up, uh, uh, opinion, expectation, dishonesty. That seems rather obscure, but, but, but that would require somebody like me or Randy or somebody who is an expert observer, so we, 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 could, we could fake it and give, say, extraordinarily high values of optical density if we wish. It'd be perverse. And I've only done it a few times for amusement at Waterford uh, to, to play with John uh, Nolan's mind. <laughs> Gets them real upset. But aside from uh, perverted experts, uh, that doesn't come up too often. But I mean, the point is, is this distinction uh, worthwhile between the two? And, and one knows why you, you have it, I think, philosophically speaking. Uh, the psychophysical methods are, in fact, subjective in the sense that it requires a sentient, conscious being to make some kind of statement about what they see. 
But in good psychophysics, that statement is, is, is trivial, like the minimum of a null point or the minimum flicker or something. In other words, it's hard to know how uh, opinion, expectation, uh, and dishonesty in the non-expert could lead to manipulating or, or influencing uh, a decision based on a, a, a null principle. So my argument here clearly is that uh, it, it's not very useful. Um, and a better distinction is simply physical and psychophysical. If you go back to Helmholtz, I mean, he did a lot of you know, experiments like this, but uh, he, he was reasonably objective and rigorous uh, a person. So psychophysical, physical doesn't involve implications from the objective versus subjective. And, and you all know, obviously, that even with a physical device, there's a real issue uh, about you know, what's out there and what you're observing, what you're calculating. In other words, what is objective and, and, and what isn't. So this is a, a quagmire. I suggest we avoid it by referring to these different devices as physical versus psychophysical and get on with the questions that are really important, like validity, repeatability, cost, whatever you want, safety. You know, some require high light levels. Age factors are interesting and important interest, uh, uh, um, efficiency. Uh, and uh, so on. And, oops, the computer isn't doing what it did this morning. Liz, did you set this up a little off? Or I'm supposed to have my uh, slideshow on one side so I'll know what I'm doing. Oh. Otherwise, I'll have to fake it. We tried to set this up last night and <laughs> didn't, but um, Martin kindly did. Oops, Whoops, no, no, that, that, perhaps not. We won't waste a lot of time on it. I'll just uh, continue anyway. That's OK. It's a little bit of a surprise, though. You don't like surprises during talks. But anyway. <laughs> um, now, fortunately, uh, I won't have to talk or review much about these other methods, uh, uh, other than the psychophysical ones, which I know most about. Quite interesting, and, and, and I've been concerned with them in the past. But there was just recently a review comparing all the methods by uh, Howells. I, I don't know Howells, but, but this was published in Gracie's archives. and. and it's a 32-page uh, review, and it, 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 it's absolutely stunningly excellent. It, it, it's uh, unlike Fox News, it is objective and fair <laughs> and, and balanced <laughs> and, and, and thorough. There's a few minor technical details that one can quibble with, but I commend you here. Uh, you'll learn about these methods, their strengths, limitations, assumptions, uh, and so on from, from this really excellent article. Uh, and uh, as I say, it liberates me from uh, having to literally review it, which I can't. So I'm going to focus uh, not on um, the um, physical methods and not even on all the psychophysical methods because theirs too is a lengthy list fairly and, and, and boring to, to go over, but Howells covers those well too. Rather, I want to uh, concentrate on what I know best, which is aspects of heterochromatic flicker which is uh, perhaps the, the dominant, it is the dominant psychophysical method and is fairly widely used uh, uh, to, to measure macular pigment in general. Uh, that is to say, uh, in uh, not only uh, ex experimental labs, but, but also clinics to some extent. So we all know what flicker is. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but, but, but you're literally alternating two lights. It should be called alternating light photometry, because uh, flicker is a subjective experience. I just got through saying what's objective and what not, but alternating two radiances like this is the physical event in, in psychophysics. The event that you perceive here is flicker. Just like if you see uh, this red up here, there, there, there's no red in the head, as Newton pointed out. <laughs> All the rays uh, are uh, devoid uh, of color, rather it's um, how the body, uh, the eye, and the brain uh, uh, re 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 respond to it. So, so uh, this is alternating, but I'll continue to use the term occasionally flicker. When I, when I mean alternating, sometimes I'll use flicker when I mean uh, 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 what you perceive. I, 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 even, even I uh, can't be uh, consistent on this, and I'm the one who's made a little point of it. But, but nevertheless, uh, those are just uh, terminological things again. If you alternate two energies like this in, in time, you don't have to, by the way, uh, uh, sum them to the same. This is called a yoke method. This could be the same, flat, and then you could be alternating uh, this. If you have two different wavelengths, uh, this is the typical heterochromatic flicker photometry scenario. 
and uh, is uh, fairly widely used. I want to spend just a few seconds to go over uh, not the literal history of it, but just a, a little bit about uh, the history. This goes back, this use of alternating lights to achieve a minimum flicker or a null point, <coughs> goes back uh, into the 19th century and consider uh, what they had back there. If you were, say, a chemist and you wanted to get the spectral absorption of some solution, say, some copper sulfate solution, kind of a bluish, kind of a bluish green, how would you do that? Uh, uh, no photocells, uh, no, no AC or DC in, in, in the wall. <laughs> and, and you could do it, and they did do it with flicker photometry. Imagine you have a light source. Sometimes they were literally candles, but, but later they were carbon la lamps and so on. I mean, they did have uh, to power these in some cases. Say two sources, and in one case, let's say you put a cell of water in there. The other case, you put a cell of some bluish solution and a prism here in order to disperse the spectrum. And then you combine them in some optical way that uh, we don't have to talk about, and you alternate them like this, usually with chopping discs or spinning mirrors, and you, at each wavelength, find the minimum flicker. That is heterochromatic, different wavelengths. Flicker, photometry is the science of, or engineering aspect of, of, of light. And they chose it, and you could do it with different wavelengths, and you can actually calculate the spectral absorption of a, of a solution. This was widely done before photocells and so on uh, uh, and electronics uh, uh, came along. So in the early part of this century when people wanted to establish the, the, the science of light measurement called photometry, they had a similar problem. I mean, how are they going to define the power of different wavelengths to excite the eye? Because they knew, of course, that and defined, light is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that humans can see. That's what light is in, in its defined method. But wavelengths have differing properties in terms of exciting uh, the eye. So you have to define that property in order to make an efficiency function that allows you to calculate uh, along with assumed standard lamps, originally candles, but later you know, glowing platinum. The, 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 the standards allow you to specify light quantitatively in terms of how it stimulates the eye, how much, and this is the whole science of, uh, of photometry, and so they turned, you know, how are they going to do that? You can't put an electrode in, well actually there weren't electrodes in anyway, but, but you, you, you have to turn to some kind of method to equate and establish the amount of energy in different lights to give the same result. So of course they turned to heterochromatic flicker photometry and, and they, they did uh, combine different wavelengths to see how they were relatively efficient and define what is the standard and, and the absolute basis of, of modern photometry, uh, and it, it's the human luminous efficiency function. It's uh, this one here, V lambda, peaking at about 555 nanometers. This is the, uh, 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 the average curve based on, oh, a couple hundred subjects. Mostly run, but not entirely, at the National Physical Laboratory here in uh, Great Britain in, 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 in Teddington uh, by a uh, number of people, Stiles and others, Crawford uh, and, and so on. And the International Commission on Illumination averaged these data points for about 100 subjects. People didn't differ much, and so they defined this curve. And it has admirable qualities. For example, if you have uh, <coughs> this wavelength and this wavelength at equal sensitivity, and you define how much uh, it takes to match that light, those two, or these two, and write the number down, and then if you take half of this, of, of, of this one and half of this one, add them together, and it'll match the, the, the standard. That's called additivity. It's an for, important formal property. If you didn't have additivity, you couldn't have a science of photometry because it means that at different levels, at different wavelengths uh, mainly, uh, you'd get different results. It would be absolutely disastrous. So uh, this takes advantage of flicker photometry not only in its uh, accuracy with respect to the matching task, but also with, with, with respect to the fact that uh, it, it's additive and, and independent of luminance and so on. And, and so we owe a lot already to photometry. This is the modern standard for lighting engineering in terms of efficiency. This is a scotopic function, which uh, who cares really? 
Well, some do, but <laughs> uh, I don't. And it, by the way, it wasn't uh, defined with Flickr uh, because it's sensitive, very, very uh, low values. It, it's sluggish. Uh, thresholds were mainly used, as I recall, possibly matching. But anyway, uh, um, now, just because you use Flickr photometry doesn't mean that all Flickr photometric methods and devices are the same, because in psychophysics, the stimulus conditions and the procedural methods are crucial with respect to the results you get. You can't just take a couple lights and start slamming them together and so on and expect it to, uh, to give uh, quantitatively accurate, repeatable results that agrees with everybody else. Here's one example, for example, uh, here's one example uh, that we could uh, uh, point to. In one method of flicker photometry, a, a background, frequently blue, but doesn't have to be, blue solid background is uh, concentric with the mixture uh, of the two in question which is added to it is, is a pedestal. In other words, it's a true background. This is added to it. That has certain uh, uh, properties that, that are important. I only want to point out that another way to do it is to have this alone, and then this is a surround. Uh, they, they sort of look the same if you look at them, but they have different potential properties and so on. This is just to point out that you have to be careful in psychophysics. Well, I, I think with any systematic investigation, any field, I mean, you get different results depending upon at what your method is and, and what your uh, stimulus is or whatever is equivalent to, to a stimulus and what you're doing. So, whoops. Most important though probably is the methodology you use in your, in your Flickr photometer. And, 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 and here's what I mean. The question of whether the alternating stimulus will be perceived as Flickr or not flickering is what's called in psychophysics a two-knob adjustment. There's two physical variables that affect flicker, uh, that is perceived flicker as, as a function of, of the alternation rate and the energy. One, of course, is the rate itself. So if you have a um, rate that's very low, ah, finger over it, very low, say two cycles per second, it's just kind of lumbering along, then almost any uh, uh, red-green ratio that will cancel the macular pigments uh, contribution and allow you to estimate it uh, will uh, uh, move it this way and that way. But, but even the best will give a minimum flicker rather than no flicker at all. For example, you may say, why is that important? If you have a very, very high rate, for example, a million hertz <laughs> per second, of course, you won't perceive any flicker no matter what the ratio of blue to green because the eye can only follow depending on the conditions, uh, up to about 100 hertz alternation before uh, it's seen as, as fused. If, however, you vary the, 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 the rate of the physical alternation and the ratio of the uh, uh, blue-green energies, uh, so to speak, you can find an optimal point where the flicker, as you're adjusting this knob, will go down and reach a minimum and go up and the minimum means that you have a, a fusion point here rather than a fusion zone or no fusion at all. Flicker, fusion point, fusion zone, all the same people doing, uh, they, they hope that, you know, the same thing when they look at it, but you get different results. Now, which one do you want? This one formally is more desirable because the two knobs are idiosyncratic to that particular person, that is the adjustment of them. People differ with reflector respect to flicker sensitivity, just like they differ on all, uh, many other attributes. So <laughs> this is definable if you do the optimal for each person. Everybody is seeing that at the match point. That's good because uh, in psychophysics, uh, the assumption is that if, if people are seeing the same thing, it implies the same processes are working, it's the same response criterion, and, 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 and the same underlying physiology, same cones are stimulated, and so on. Uh, if you just pick a, a, a flicker rate kind of uh, based on judgment, maybe it's here for me, so the best I can do is flicker. Maybe it's a perfect match for one of you, in which case you see no flicker at the best point. Or if you have poor flicker sensitivity, alternating sensitivity to light, then you'll have a zone here because your resolving power isn't very good. All the same stimulus, but because of the different properties of the human, 
Uh, you, they will, in fact, see different things. And that comes dangerously close to thinking everybody's doing the same experiment, but actually they're enrolled in three different experiments, in, in, in a sense, which can be important if that maybe affects the results. So, so that's what we're looking at. Now, a few years, Liz, would you remind me when I have about 15 minutes left? I don't see a clock here somewhere, but... Now, the issue I'm going to focus on in the talk today is not even everything about heterochromatic flicker photometry, no matter how you do it. But I thought it'd be more interesting to focus on an interesting and unresolved issue, but one that teaches us what any measurement method should address. That is to say, what are you actually measuring and where on the retina are you measuring it? Because the retina, the macular pigment is distributed in, in a certain way. And, and so the issue of what your number means in many ways is, is crucial. In this particular way, uh, this interesting historical uh, background uh, uh, goes back some number of years when I, I personally started doing uh, some flicker photometry addressed to this problem because I was doing an experiment on color vision uh, uh, at, at, at Brown, the only color named university, but anyway. <laughs> and and, and um, the macular pigment was, this was years ago, was an extreme annoyance because you want to know in a quantitative experiment in color vision how much light is reaching the outer segments. You don't care about macular pigment or lens or all that uh, junk in front of the <laughs> receptors. And so in order to do that, you have to measure uh, both lens and macular pigment in each person and correct for it in order to know how much light is reaching what counts in color perception, which of course are the uh, lights, the level receptors. So, so, so we worked this out and used different spots, very, very tiny spots. So here's a center of And by the way, this is the funnest picture that Max Snodderly kindly took of me. Uh, this is my retina, I think. Uh, we had several subjects in blue light and you can see the blood vessels and so on, and, and the macular pigment is absorbing blue, so of course uh, it looks dark. Uh, the white spots in the cross, of course, were added by the person who made the picture. They're not actually on the retina, but anyway. <laughs> uh, that's for the uh, uh, epidemiologists in the crowd. <laughs> Sorry, just joking, Julie. <laughs> so with small spots located at different positions with respect to the fovea, and, and each one uh, uh, al having alternating lights as described, you can actually measure the amount at each locus. Fixation here is very good under these conditions. Fixation varies probably about uh, uh, six minutes or so, which is what um, well under a, a tenth of a millimeter in retinal space. Now, we make them a little bigger if we go out to correct for the differential properties of the retina. This is the retina. Oops. This is the reference point because this is a reference method. In other words, whatever macular pigment is here, we, we, we assume from uh, bone and land room, very little, quote, optically not detectable, but, but some there, of course. The amount we measure here is always reference to the, 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 that position. Many devices do that, even the physical ones, because they too have a signal so low out there that the signal itself doesn't make much sense. Of course, in our sense, the signal is defined by zeroing there. So we did that, and then uh, we uh, uh, averaged the five subjects initially and, and, and made one of the graphs that I, I most enjoyed creating the days before computers. And this is the uh, three-dimensional graph. This, now the retina's down here. There's the fovea, temporal, nasal, and so on. And these are, these are point one units of density, one, two, three, four, five. So the average person in the very center of the fovea with a very tiny spot is about 0.7. And you can see it falls, pretty, uh, appears to be symmetrical. And uh, in fact, in many subjects, is well described by a, a two-factor exponential, one for the height, of course, and one for the, uh, uh, the, the rate of fall factor as you go away from the, the fovea. <clears throat> now, if you <coughs> reflect all these, uh, these four axes around, and, and superpose them, you, you'll see uh, that, 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 that they're pretty symmetric. That seems to be largely true uh, as well. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, I observed once that uh, if you take a one degree spot, a disk, not a tiny spot, one degree, that's pretty big, and you measure the macular pigment using a one degree spot, 
you've got a value, that plot's a little off, by the way, <laughs> physically. I think they took the zero here. Anyway, just notice that. You will get a value for the one degree spot that is the same as the 0.5 degree one taken with a little tiny spot. In other words, it seems that even with a, a, a disk, as opposed to a little tiny spot right here, it refers to the edge with reference to the number you get. Now that's actually important because if you're using this, you want to be able to, uh, to, to, to map this and, and, and so on. If it didn't measure from the edge, it isn't clear where it would be referenced to, if any spot in particular. Maybe, as uh, Professor Bonus suggested, it, it would just integrate over here in some way. Every method, whatever it is, needs to know the rule for which uh, the spot <coughs> refers. That is, is it integrating? Is it referring maybe uh, to here or there or the edge or, 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 or what is it? And in my judgment, some of the uh, physical methods and, and some of the um, psychophysical methods ha haven't met that yet. But we thought we had. <coughs> we thought that this was the, in fact, we call it the edge effect. And Later, it wasn't tested very thoroughly, but later uh, I think Randy Hamm and I did a couple more trials and it seemed to hold up. But we didn't do it uh, systematically. But, but, but um, the people down at Florida did, Bone, Landrum, and is it, is it Gibert? Gibert is the third author? Richard? I'm not sure how the name is pronounced. Let's call it Gibert. <laughs> Gibert. Ah, even though he's Spanish, Gibert, okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in, in a lengthy and thorough paper, and they reached an entirely different conclusion, but it was a more systematic study. They reached the conclusion that some people referenced here, some here, but most people referenced about halfway between the center and the edge for uh, targets in the area of half a degree and, and uh, uh, 1.3 quarter degrees uh, out. So they got a non-edge effect. And because of the importance of this with respect to the method that I advocate and use, uh, uh, five, ten minutes? Okay. I thought this should be looked at again. Uh, and, and so we did. We'll skip that. So we used ring stimuli like they did, uh, and the point is that, that uh, this ring here should give a value matching the edge of that if the edge effect is right, because it's, we know it's sampling there. And we used a wider range than the Florida group, but, but the same logic uh, uh, applied. And we got this with an average of uh, eight subjects. Here's MPOD, and you see that if that's the disk and that's the ring, there would be a slight non-edge effect there, but, but not substantial. But up to about a degree or so, a little less uh, radius, we got essentially no edge effect at all. Now this is best shown rather than this slide. By the way, the only one statistically different was this one, oddly enough, but a very uh, small, significant difference there. Uh, now, each subject alone, though, is a little different picture. Most subjects didn't depart much or up and down or whatever. One of the worst culprits, uh, to my uh, embarrassment, was subject BW. When I went beyond what I had verified, there was a departure, although th this is fairly slight. But to my credit, uh, too, I have to say that in all the work I've done in the machines that we've developed, anything bigger than what I've established, we in fact already use rings instead of disks, being conservative that way. So there's a slight departure there, but, but as this subject, too. Now, it's actually best seen, I think put in context with the next slide, which shows plotting the ring versus the um, disk in kind of a scatter plot. And there it is for the very small quarter degree. You see that it's extraordinary. I mean, this is edge effect all the way, isn't it? Uh, a slope of one, intercept effect is zero, and a very high correlation. These are individual subjects plot against each other. And there's uh, for 0.5 degree, still good. Pretty good there, slight offset, but the 0.75 degree radius still gives a, a very good edge effect, in my judgment. Even going up here, it's pretty good at, at one degree. Then Beyond you get, there's an offset, and then by two degrees it kind of collapses. I mean, there's small values here. These are uh, individual differences between subjects. But we conclude then anything under about uh, a degree radius, or certainly 0.75 degree radius, shows an exceptionally uh, precise edge effect under the conditions of our experiment. I want to stress that. 
because Richard uh, and his group certainly stressed that their results were within the context of their apparatus and procedure. Any good psychophysicist will say that, uh, 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 that will stand up in court. <laughs> Here's a comparison between some of their results and ours. Um, this is the MPOD of, of the disk versus the ring. So uh, perfect edge effect at 0.5 degrees would, would follow this line of slope of 1, which, which ours do, you see. But the Florida groups depart right here. I mean, that, that's what they're talking about. And a significant offset here uh, extrapolated. This is the 0.75 degree. And you see the result we have is pretty close. I'm not bragging about it. It's just what we got. And, 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 and here is the, the departure. Now, the question then, here, here, this compares the two. And then I'll, I, I will reveal what I think is the, the reason that we get the edge effect. <clears throat> Here's Richard's result here plotted as a function of how far across the stimulus do you get uh, the uh, uh, value. That, that is, this is the 50% point. That point would be out here for the edge effect. As it is for our stimulus up to that area, then you get a little drop there. Just, this line is just made up, of course. I don't know what it looks like, really. This is about, the edge effect here would be about here, would be about 80, uh, 90% or something. It, it's relatively small, but, but you know, there it is, mainly driven by two subjects, uh, as a matter of fact. Now, the question is, why do you get the edge effect? Because, because if you think back at this, if you've got a two-degree stimulus that matches your pigment level is very low, so if you're matching at the edge, it means that as you go up, there's more and more modulation of the receptors, right? Because, uh, because you're leaving it at, at, at what matches for the, for the two degree point. By the fovea, in an average uh, person with maybe slightly high macular pigment, if it's matched at the two degree locus, the foveal receptor is being modulated 90%. I, 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 sorry, a factor of eight. They're just slamming along like this, okay? So, there's considerable challenge here. How can it be, first, why does the point drift to the edge of the stimulus in the stimulus frequency, the FR optimal match? And when it does, why in the world don't you see the receptors and the, uh, the uh, flicker in the fovea where the thing is, should be is slammed along? They're just absolutely whamming along. And you might say that they're, they're, they're not silent. I mean, they're there. They're, they're, they're saying, here I am, okay? But they're ignored. So why is that? And we think we know why in a functional sense, that is, uh, in terms of different psychophysical relations, uh, 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 why that's true. It has to do with the observation we made that the optimal frequency with disk of different size goes up linearly approximately with the, the, the radius of, of the disk. So if you take my eye, for example, with different disks, two degree, one degree, a uh, very tiny one, you see there's my optimal frequency as I've defined, that is the frequency ratio match for uh, no flicker, and it goes to the edge. Why does it go to the edge? Why no flicker? Well, this goes up, and I won't review the history of this, but uh, anyway, you can see that's true for every subject. There's the average, so, and, and they differ between people. The point is, consider uh, how obvious this is after you've thought about it. Up here, the, 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 the fusion is at 20 hertz in my eye. Down here is at 12. So if I made a two degree match up here for the uh, macular pigment that value, and I suddenly pushed a button, as we can do, and make that stimulus very small, it's not flickering. Even though the receptors are just charging along. Now we did a little uh, observation to show that. Oh, this just shows uh, at 15 hertz, here again, obvious, different people disagree a lot with respect to the, uh, uh, flicker sensitivity. Here's what we did. This experiment is pretty easy to explain. It isn't as bad as it looks. Imagine a two degree disk right here and you match there for optimal frequency. Then you just shift to the very tiny one. It will be fused. You can unfuse it. That is, you can make it flicker by adjusting the blue-green ratio. You have to go up quite a bit and then, then it'll flicker, of course. Or you have to go to get out of that. This the whole thing is the null zone. That's the null zone we talked about. If you go this way, you can get out. The closer you go to the two degree stimulus, of course, the smaller that null zone, it's kind of a trumpet shape. So in a way, you see, it goes to two degrees, that is the match point, because 
That's where the retina is most sensitive to flicker under these conditions. Okay? That's where it goes. It silences everything smaller than it because they have smaller frequency, lower frequency sensitivities, as we've just shown. So it goes there because that's where the sensitivity is, and then it swallows everything smaller than it. That's why when you look at uh, such a stimulus, with this match, okay, it will be uh, absolutely no flicker across the entire disk. The output of the retina, probably phasic ganglion cells, uh, are, are, are not reporting in. And I, I'm short on time, so I want to, oh, oh, I got to go to my uh, demonstration. So it's, so that's an edge effect with, in this sense, right? The edge dominates. Now, in psychology, I mean, there's a lot of edge effects. There's nothing new to, to psychologists. For example, if you, uh, let's go to the next, whoops, ah, ah that's, the, that's the treat, the next one. If you look at these two disks, I think you see, this is, the photographs aren't great, but this disk looks darkish, that disk looks darkish. The stimulus there, actually, in this disk is what you would think of, that's going to look dark because it's below this level. This is made, by the way, by spinning disks, okay? This is from Cornsweet's book. I, I didn't do it, Tom Cornsweet's book. If you look right there, there it is. Now, over here, it, it, it looks the same. Well, why? The actual energy or illuminance between the center and the edge is the same. Over here, it's different, yet these two look pretty much the same. It's because the receptive fields of these phasic cells, whether they're looking at flicker or not, alternating light, uh, at the edge form this little uh, sort of bicuspid increase uh, 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 at the edge, and they don't respond to homogeneous illumination. That's been old finding since Kufler's cat work in 1952. Okay? So the pattern here is uh, that you get the bicuspid here, and presumably the brain fills in. It, it likes to see edges. That's what edges are for. And uh, the brain will sink in on the edges, and it will fill this in. Now, there's other filling in processes. I mean, the most well-known one is happening right now, right? Right now, as you look at the stage, okay, uh, there's a blind spot in your, uh, uh, say, with one eye, to keep it simple. There's a blind spot in your, visual uh, in your visual field where the head of the optic nerve has no receptors, and therefore you can see nothing. But you, you never see a hole in your visual field under these conditions, do you? There's some condition where you can show it. That's a cortical or central filling in. So is this. Now, the fascinating thing, though I want to emphasize this, I have slides, but I can say it, I think. The fascinating thing about the flicker effect, that is to say you see no flicker uh, uh, anywhere, is that it's explained entirely at the level of the ganglion cells. Because under these conditions, the ganglion cells that report in are absolutely silenced from the edge of the stimulus all the way across. There's no activity due to their own properties well established by, by the physiologist. So there, you see, there's an edge effect that's explained at the level of the retinal ganglion cells. If you lose that information at retinal ganglion cells, you can't recreate it later. That's the basic principle information theory, right? Whereas this one is not uh, uh, explainable at the level. In other words, this is what the ganglion cells are doing. So the brain says to itself, well, there's an edge there, so I'm going to assume everything interior to it is essentially homogeneous. I mean, this is metaphoric, of course. Now, uh, how much time, Don? A few minutes? Like 30 or 40? No, no, I, I, I'm fast. I'm fast. The last, uh, the next, the last one has a little uh, gift to it, a little, little lanyap, so to speak. And I wasn't sure if it would work because we made this and, uh, on film years ago and then put it on a computer and scanned it and then brought it over here and put it there. But to my amazement, it, it works for most people. And it shows what happens when, whoops, when you don't have a good edge. Not this one, but the next one will. Here you see there's no edge at all and you see nothing in here. Here there's an edge, but you see nothing. Why? That's an edge only way you've defined it. It's not a spatiotemporal edge that registers the bicuspid sort of uh, 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 inflection that would give it uh, what you've already seen. Okay. So these are all different central effects or, or, or peripheral effects. Now the last one I want to show is, 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 is like this one. That is to say, there's a fuzzy luminous distribution between the two uh, here. In this case, though, there's a distribution with respect to wavelengths. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look right there at that spot, very carefully, with one eye. Hold a hand over the other eye. 
fixate very carefully right there in the middle of the red splotch and, and, and let me know what happens. Do we have a customer? What happens? It disappears. Now blink your eye, it'll come back, right? This illustrates a lot. Of, how many don't see that? Stephen doesn't? I'll tell you what, if you go to the back room later and something you'll see, because the reason I was edgy about this, it, it, it's distance dependent, because the further away you get, the smaller image on the retina, and, and that means uh, uh, this is a sharper transition. If that was a, a, a true 100% transition, a step function here to here, you would look at it and it wouldn't disappear. Why? Well, it's certainly important. Otherwise, I'd be disappearing if you look at me. But uh, what's happening, of course, is that as you fixate on a point like that, the retina is actually moving, engaging in what's called micro saccades, a few minutes of arc, six, seven minutes of arc under fixation conditions. And it's continually renewing the border across a physical border, that is the border on the retina. Now here, this, this mem that's called a stabilized image if you, if you nullify those eye movements, as Professor Riggs and Ditchburn independently did, Ditchburn over here, uh, uh, Riggs at Brown. If you stabilize that optically so it's not moving on the retina, even a sharp edge will disappear. But you can mimic a stabilized image by not stabilizing it, but making the transition so shallow that it's effectively not an edge and it, and it disappears. So my, my, my message here then is that uh, in any method, of course, they're all idiosyncratic to the issues, but this is an example where uh, uh, this edge effect isn't obvious, and it, it's due to the spatial temporal properties of, of the retina, which are very complex as a function of eccentricity. And, and even with the brain making, say, well, that's fine, but this is what you're going to see, perhaps at the end. Again, the interesting thing about the maximal frequency uh, uh, ratio, optimal method uh, that we use, that, that, that can be used, is, is that... The ratio drifts to the edge, that's the edge effect. And the flicker, the differential flicker sensitivity poor in the, uh, in the fovea, good at two degrees, for example, will swallow the flicker that would ordinarily be uh, seen uh, by the receptors that are being driven quite actively under, under these conditions. So every method has to be examined with particular emphasis to its own uh, properties and, and, and strengths and weaknesses and, and possible artifacts uh, and so on. Uh, in this case, uh, so far, I think we've come out well with respect uh, to this view of Flecker. And again, I would qualify it only in the same modest way that, um, that Bo and his colleagues did. They said, this is what they got with their apparatus and procedure. So I'm going to quote them. This is what we got with our apparatus and procedure. <laughs> uh, okay. oh.